our project was called uh, Disconnected Infrastructures and Violence Against Women, Innovating Digital Technologies for Creating Safer Cities. And this included uh, an international and interdisciplinary research team from UK and India, including two non-academic partners, most of, whom, most of whom are present here. Um, and it's been in, uh, the, the principal investigator myself is located in King's College, uh, and the co-investigators are located also in King's College and in London School of Economics. And we have one co-investigator who's been uh, located in India. <coughs> so that's our project team. As you can see, a large number of people, uh, but also a very interesting and exciting group of people who come with different interdisciplinary skills. So that's the first one, that's myself. Uh, then we have Rafi Tripathi <laughs> sitting there, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, she is a digital innovator, she is uh, our co-investigator in India, she's from Four School of Management. Then we have Don Slater, who unfortunately can't be here in the morning because he has to sit in an exam board, uh, but he will be here after lunch. He's a sociologist, a media sociologist. Uh, with him we have Joe Entwistle, who's from King's College London, who's sitting there. She is also a co-investigator and a sociologist and in media studies. Um, we have Nabila. Uh, who is our research associate. She is the, really the kind of the person who's held the whole team together. She, is, um, she has been um, doing field work with us. She's been doing a lot of the analysis. So much of what we present, what I present today, has been with Nabila and, and with Nabila taking some of that lead there. We also have Susan, Susan Sakanya, who is uh, our local research assistant in Kerala, and she is really kind of the grassroots, the bottom-up person who's done all the data collection for us, uh, going into these communities, uh, talking to the women there um, every day, all the hard work you've done uh, with the interviews, with the transit walks, with the digital uh, innovation, etc. We also have our partners here. <coughs> but at least one of our partners, Kalpana Vishwanath, who is there, she wants to raise hands. She is a CEO of Safety Pin. Safety Pin is a software, um, ICT, a social enterprise. They also have a software that uses, uh, which we use as a method to map safety and infrastructure in the city, and we'll talk about that a bit more later. Uh, so Kalpana has been also instrumental in supporting us and helping us, and giving us feedback, <coughs> also intellectually directing the course of this uh, project. With Kalpana, we have uh, Riti Mandal, who couldn't be here today, but she's also been behind the scenes in, in all our aspects. In fact, she was here in the last workshop that we had in British Academy. Uh, she's a senior program manager. And also Saki, who is the feminist NGO who works actually in Kerala, the local NGO. We had Rajita Ji, the project officer, who also has not been here, is not here this time, but she has been here before in our previous workshop at the British Academy. So that's a big project team, and as you can see, a very interdisciplinary project team. <clears throat> so just, uh, I think the rest of this uh, half an hour, I'll uh, just kind of give a brief overview of the project and kind of the drivers of why we decided to do this and some of our key recommendations. And of course, even though it's project, this project's finished officially, we haven't published everything out of it, particularly the academic work, but I can also talk about some of the emerging themes and outputs that are coming from here. So the reason we focused on Kerala in this project in terms of looking at the disconnected between different types of infrastructures and looking at what that means or how that impacts on violence against women was because Kerala has what's been called a Kerala paradox, that it has a high level, at least on the books, of gender empowerment, gender development, but also a high level of rising violence against women. And in this context, the digital sphere, which is already understood to have uh, be divided across gender, takes a really important and really high significance in Kerala. Because in Kerala, the government of Kerala was the first Indian state to declare internet access a basic human right in 2017. But again, just like the Kerala paradox, there's, there's a large number of women who have been left out of it, particularly in the low-income neighborhoods in the, in the peripheral areas of Kerala. And of course, like reflecting the patterns across the world, men own more uh, mobile phones. There's this uneven digital infrastructures, the digital connectivity. Even if you have mobile phones, the digital connectivity across different parts of the city is not the same. So there are overlapping layers between physical infrastructures and digital infrastructures. And we were really interested in seeing where are these hot spots and blind spots, blind spots. Where do these women fit in or don't? 
So conceptually, this looks like a really complicated map. But conceptually, how we uh, were, how we have approached this project is to think through an infrastructural turn in urban development. That when we, uh, particularly in academic research and scholarly work, there has been a focus, increasing focus on infrastructure as a way to think through some of the social inequalities, so some of the material inequalities, but also some of the gendered inequalities. And this infrastructural turn was our entry point into thinking through uh, some of the questions in this project. Um, and we, we investigated this across different scales of influence. So if you see these horizontal layers, these are different scales. So we have the global scale where we have the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Gender Initiatives, um, and also the New Urban Agenda. But also at the national scale, you have other programs like the Smart Cities Mission, which tries to present a technological fix for social problems like gender safety. We have the Clean India Mission, which tries to provide toilets in order also to make, makes the argument that if you have toilets, then you have less problems with VAW violence against women. You also have Digital India, which uh, seeks to empower and, uh, and, and provide digital access across both rural and urban areas. So how do these policies and uh, projects and initiatives impact on other scales, like the local scale of the city uh, and the communities and, of course, the households? Um, so in Kerala um, and, of course, in India, we have the Nirbhaya Act, which has recently uh, been uh, proposed and, and sa sanctioned. It's, it's amended, amended new laws um, on violence against women. In Kerala, we also have what has been what's been called the pink police, so police patrol cars, particularly focusing on women's safety. But also the main approach towards women, uh, violence against women has been through CCTV and surveillance networks. So increased use of CCTVs, increased use of surveillance cameras, uh, but also proposals from the, uh, from the police, uh, from the municipality for different kinds of safety apps to use, for women to use as a kind of fix for uh, feelings of danger or, feeling, or experiences of violence. So we wanted to focus on the digitally driven urban transformations, in, uh, particularly in marginal areas of the city, like the resettlement colonies, the peripheral areas, the low-income neighborhoods. Um, and the way that we conceived it is that this has a, a key role, this, this has a key influence in transforming gender relationships within the house and also vice versa. The gender power relationships within households and communities have an impact on how uh, digital infrastructures are used, accessed, or experienced. So one of the, one of the key transformations that we uh, understood in the household was the, was, the, was the migration into the city when traditional structures, traditional gender power relations were completely transformed. Uh, there was increased entry of women into the public sphere, uh, but these women didn't have, they lacked digital capacity, mobile phones, but also within households, <clears throat> there's been an increased dependence on women's wages because of unemployment amongst men, substance abuse, um, and, and other forms of alcohol abuse and so on. What it has meant is it's increased time pressures on women's lives. They need to increasingly access employment, access livelihoods, but at the same time, there's been increased male presence within these communities because of unemployment. Um, so even within communities, even within the neighborhoods where these women stay, there is lack of safe spaces. There is increased experiences of domestic violence and violence against women within the public spaces of their neighborhood. So all of this we were we put together as kind of three key issue. One is that there's been at a higher scale, at a city and a national scale, neglect of public infrastructure in all its forms, whether it's water, sanitation, public transport. But also alongside that, <clears throat> there is weak access to digital infrastructure, whether that is because of lack of digital networks, whether that's because of lack of mobile phones or lack of digital capacity. And then within that also, um, at another scale, there has been weak access to household infrastructure or neighborhood infrastructure. So you have other layers such as erratic water supply in Kerala, particularly with flooding, water logging, and drainage problems. Uh, there's little rubbish collection. There is poor telecommunications um, and no Wi-Fi broadband. So most of these communities and uh, households access Wi-Fi and broadband through their mobile telephones. So the mobile telephony is the route to accessing the internet and all sorts of information in the public sphere. 
So we club all of this together as different forms of violence against women. So violence against women is not necessarily men coming and <clears throat> doing um, harassing women in the public space, although that is one form. But violence is structural, it's cultural, it's symbolic, and, and, it's, and it's various forms through infrastructure, through and with infrastructure. Um, and the, one of the key uh, aims of this project, because it is GCRF funded money, is that we were making contributions uh, or challenging some of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And we were particularly focusing on two SDGs, the SDG 5, Gender Equality, and SDG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities. Within these two, uh, I think our project revealed two particular targets as problematic or, or targets that we could make contributions to um, in terms of challenging some of the assumptions within that. First was target 5.B.1, where it says that an indicator of gender equality is the proportion of individuals who mo own a mobile telephone by sex, which means that the larger number of women who own a mobile phone means there is an there's an increased gender equality in that context. Uh, but of course, our findings found that just, just owning a mobile phone itself is very complicated because you might not formally own a mobile phone, you might borrow it. <coughs> but also that just owning a mobile phone doesn't necessarily give you gender equality. And that's one of the key things. And we have several narratives and, and, uh, and discussions around that. The other target that we particularly uh, particularly came into focus when we were doing our research was target 11.2, that by 2030, providing access to safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable transport systems for all, improving road safety, notably by expanding public transport, special attention to needs of those in vulnerable situations. So <clears throat> this particular target is about improving access to infrastructure. Uh, so improving the infrastructure first and then improving access to it. And again, we found that just improving access to infrastructure doesn't necessarily mean that infrastructure will be used or that it will remove violence per se. Okay, so um, actually now I just wanted to show the, some of our research methods which we use. And this is a story map that we created and we can give you the link. We, we thought that there was going to be a laptop here which people can just go into and check the story map out, but it's not there, so we can provide you the link. Um, so our research methods were, again, at different scales. So the first scale, we used the safety pin apps method, the citywide scale. Um, and the safety pin apps audit method, I don't know why this doesn't increase. Can you, is it cut off? No. In my computer, it's cut off. Um, so the citywide scale, we did a safety pin app uh, audit. And in this, uh, and Kalpana can talk about this in more depth, uh, when she presents her paper. Uh, in this, basically, uh, a taxi goes around with a camera on its front, and it takes pictures of the, of the city, of all the roads in the city. And then these pictures are coded uh, across nine parameters, and most of these parameters are infrastructure parameters, and then given a safety score. So at a city scale, you get a clear indication <clears throat> of what is the state of the infrastructure in in that particular place. But also it's relational. So it's, it's not so much about absolute points and scores. It's also comparing between the two cities in terms of thinking through uh, what are the reasons why there might be differences in these scores. Then at, um, at a neighborhood scale, we used the Safety Pin app, and um, we did transact walks with, the, with our participants. And alongside these transact walks, we taught them we, we were like enhancing digital capacity, training them how to use the safety pin app to do manual audits. Um, and so this is a picture of one of our um, partners, uh, Radita from Saki, walking around with the participants, showing them how to use this app. And, and the women themselves, it's, it's a kind of form of crowdsourcing information about safety. So women themselves then input information about the different, the nine different parameters uh, around infrastructure and feelings of safety. And alongside this transact walk, we also have an interview narrative. So while women are walking and, and inputting their data, they're also talking about how those places are, their experiences in these places, what they encountered, uh, and why they might or might not think about these places as safe or unsafe. Then at a household scale, uh, we did this conventional ethnography and semi-structured interviews. Uh, a large part of these were done 
by uh, Susan who's sitting here. So we did in-depth interviews, but we also did mental maps. So while the safety audit using the software was literally geotagging places and give, providing narratives in those places, but the mental maps were far more subjective, they're far more cultural, and these was when women were actually drawing out maps of the places in the neighborhood and the city where they go to and talk about why these were important or not important or significant for them. So these were our participants. They were young to middle-aged women living, and this is particularly I'm talking about uh, Trivandrum. Nabila will present her work later on Kochi. These were the two cities we looked at. Um, these were young to middle-aged women living in this particular colony, and this colony was uh, a resettlement site from a slum uh, neighborhood uh, way back uh, in the 1980s when women were brought there. So we spoke with about uh, 16 women who were aged between 25 and 60 years, and they were both engaged in waged and unwaged labor. Most of them were married, some were separated, divorced, or widowed. Um, so let me go back to the slide. Uh, you, can, you can have a look at that in far more detail, but I just want to give the brief outline of our findings. So one of the, one of the findings that, or one of the strategies that we used is uh, critical, extensive critical mapping uh, of violence against women. Um, and while we were doing that, particularly through the transect walks and the interviews, what came across is the sense of intimate infrastructures. That infrastructural um, gap or infrastructural absence or disconnectedness is not only a form of violence, but it's also very intimately felt. It, all, it is also felt as a form of intimate violence. And this came across because in, in some of our community participatory workshops, which we ran alongside these interviews, we asked women what were the main things to focus on. And the women invariably replied, we want you to focus on sorting out drainage or sorting out waste or sorting out public transport. Um, and that was counterintuitive for us because given the high incidences of domestic violence and violence against women, we were expecting them to ask us to address those issues rather than infrastructural issues. Um, and what we understood from talking to them further was that those without access to urban infrastructure see infrastructural failure as a form of intimate violence. The violence against women, the domestic violence, is often normalized and internalized and seen as a, a regular and a normalized everyday aspect of their lives. Whereas the drainage and um, the, the uh, transport or any other kinds of infrastructural absence is seen as something that can be fixed by the state and something that is also their right on entitlement from the state. So we, we uh, this particular story map that I was showing you just now, that is focused on the findings from the Trivandrum uh, research. And that focuses particularly on developing this concept of intimate infrastructures that the violence of an exclusionary city is woven into its intimate material and social conditions. But this violence is also domesticated and rendered as part of the everyday. Uh, and infrastructure becomes an intimate, intimate space of the everyday in this context. So when we were mapping violence, then, then uh, a lot of the discussions was about how this infrastructure has been a form of violence in their lives. And again, uh, it is across different scales of influence from from bigger policies to everyday household gender relationships. Then what we did is, and this is something that comes across much more strongly in our story maps because it's interactive and it's, it's mobile, whereas here you're seeing a static picture. Then we presented this, some of this um, qualitative narratives and the, mobile, and the mental maps and overlaid this on maps of, GIS maps of public infrastructure, GIS maps of the infrastructure um, analysis done by Safety Pin, as well as the GIS maps of socioeconomic profiles. So this particular one is a profile, this is Trivandrum, and this is ward-based distribution of female working population. And this was our ward that we were, we were look, looking at. This was the neighborhood in this particular ward. And as you can see, the, the greener colors is where there's uh, more female worker population. And as you can see, there's, there's less female worker population. There's several reasons for that. It's not just infrastructure. But it has an impact on how many women actually go outside the house and go to the rest of the city uh, for their livelihoods, for their employment. Um, and, and a large part of that was to do with, first of all, the, the poor access to infrastructure, but also 
because the, the gender power relationships in the house was such that it was difficult for these women to actually go outside the house and, and access employment anywhere outside. So many of these women were also um, stuck in the neighborhood and, and working in and around the neighborhood. There wasn't really narratives of going very far out across into the city. So what that enabled us to do by <clears throat> overlaying different layers on each other, we could really think about the hot spots and blind spots of current urban planning. Um, and by layering socioeconomic profiles and layering public infrastructure, layering safety maps, as well as layering, so this is a screenshot from our story map, layering some of the narratives, the qualitative narratives on top of the GIS, we, we argue that we are able to reveal through critical mapping a form of slow violence, and this is something that uh, Nixon's argued about uh, in a very different context, in the context of environmental toxicity and degradation. But this slow violence is the violence that's not been seen so far. It's not been visible so far because no one's actually done a critical mapping of overlaying layers of infrastructure and socio-cultural um, analysis, as well as qualitative narratives on top of that. So we argue that we are revealing a violence that occurs gradually and out of sight. It's out of sight because it's not been mapped in, in overlapping layers. A violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space. An attritional violence that's typically not viewed as violence at all. So it's viewed in piecemeal fashion, whether you have infrastructure or not, whether you have a, any incident of violence or not, whether, you, um, whether you're able to access employment in the city or not. So these are all separately aggregated and analyzed. And what we're trying to do is bring them all together and see what happens when we analyze all of this in one map. What are the, the, the invisible slow violence that's, repeat, that's revealed to us that we've not seen before, and that's been happening over a long period of time. And one, um, this is a very um, banal example. One of the things that's been proposed by the Trivandrum uh, authority is the Xi Corridor. So this is the green line here. And this Xi Corridor is part of their Smart City Initiative where they have this technological fix to addressing violence against women. And so this is the street that's got increased Wi-Fi, it's got lots of CCTV cameras, there's increased pink police there, and so on and so forth. But actually, when you map the narratives across the city where, where all the women have experienced different forms of violence, you see it is really, uh, it's really actually pointless to have a she corridor when the violence and its connections with infrastructure is so, uh, so widespread across the city. And these are the kinds of maps that we um, have we have argued that could be useful for uh, the, the town planning board or the urban planning of the city, where maps become a way of communicating issues and problems that's not been looked at before. And then finally, the last point I want to make, and something that uh, Raki will pick up later on, is the, the key intention of our project was to innovate on digital technologies to see what are the ways that women could be able to bridge the digital divide, but also that it would empower them in a different way to think of becoming equal participants in the city, becoming equal urban citizens. So we wanted to go beyond the smart safety apps, because smart safety apps is one way of crowdsourcing and one way of reporting incidents of violence against women. But there is much more to violence against women than just reporting. Um, and we wanted to think about this, again, as a continuum, again, as temporal, spatial temporal. Um, and how, in our project, when we were talking to the women, we found that it's not only lack of access, it's not only uh, lack of network or broadband uh, or lack of smartphones, it was also because the lack of capacity made the digital phones sometimes um, scary. It made them, um, it, it, it created a mental block in which women weren't really keen to use the mobile phone itself. So we found uh, in many of the narratives that mobile phones and broadband internet becomes an extension of intimate violence through their infrastructural incapacities. So they are unable, it's, it's something that they're not familiar with, it's something that's new, and they're unable to think about using it. And even when they use it, then they're unable to understand the interfaces of these uh, safety apps or any apps that they use. They're unable to understand if the language is not familiar to them, they're unable to understand what, what it means in English. Um, so education, entertainment, communication, maintaining social networks were all listed as positive, but they weren't always sure about how to 
make this positive for them because they had, didn't have the capacity to do so. Um, and because many of them lacked smartphones, many of them uh, lacked the, the ways to use the smartphones, even if they had it. So um, a lot of them used feature phones and only really to make essential phone calls or just to use it as, as, a, as a tool for safety when if something goes wrong, I can always call someone, but not really using it as such. So what are the key recommendations that we, uh, that we are giving? We are, um, we, uh, I mean, we have several different outputs. We've uh, also now publishing different papers. We're, we're writing different papers together. But one of the key um, impact outputs that we are interested in making is to start a campaign around a right to urban technology. And this comes from several conclusions that we've drawn um, and, and in the process of also analyzing is that access, accessibility, capacity, and use of infrastructure is more important than mere presence of infrastructure. So just providing infrastructure is not going to address deep-seated social inequalities. So fixing infrastructure will not necessarily fix VAW. However, if the infrastructure is not fixed, it will certainly be a violence, a form of infrastructural violence. So it's a very um, complex relationship between infrastructure and violence. It's not exactly the same as providing or not providing. Uh, but also part of it is to think about how we should consider connectivity, coverage, and mobility across digital and physical infrastructures as being a key driver of the smart, safe city. So it's not just providing infrastructure, but how do you provide connectivity? How do you provide coverage? How do you provide mobility? And, and many of these safety apps, they work if you have um, internet connection. But in many parts of the city, you don't even have internet connection. So some of these issues with connectivity and coverage became very key in our work. Um, also, how to consider temporality and not just the geography of connections, access, and visibility of women. How is violence itself temporal? It, it changes across the day, it changes across seasons, it changes across women's life cycles as well about who these women are. So we also, of course, again, a right to urban technology is addressing increasing gender disparity in mobile phone usage, access, and digital capacity between social groups. And this is something that we focused on a lot in our, uh, in our project. And that we should do innovations in coverage, speed, and locationality of mobile infrastructures that should be directed towards both basic feature phones and smartphones. And at the moment, it's, it's directed mainly towards smartphones because the apps are all smartphone-based. Uh, and we realize that many of these women use feature phones which don't have any of these um, features. So I just want to end with some of the things that we've been doing, and particularly the kind of non-academic impacts and innovation work and, uh, that we have been working on. So we, we, in the process of publishing a set of toolkits, we've already uh, published one, which is the Gender Inclusive app. It's been on Twitter. It's also on our website. And that's been developed uh, between uh, us and uh, Raki and Nabila. Uh, they've been key in producing this together. It's, it's really to look at uh, what a gender inclusive app might look like, um, whether we need to have more icons than text, whether we need to have different sorts of colors, uh, what kinds of language they should have, and so on and so forth. Our story maps have been key, again, in disseminating some of our findings and research work. And again, I, as I said, you can go on, the, on our website and, and access them. And at the moment now, finally, we're, we're looking at creating a gender-sensitive design toolkit. Um, and that's, again, with um, uh, support and partnership with Safety Pin, because they have a lot of uh, information around the urban planning and the infrastructure elements of the city and how to incorporate that into a guideline for gender-sensitive gender design. We've done a number of capacity building work with our project participants in Kochi and Trivandrum. Particularly, like I suggested, our methodology has also been part of our impact work because our methodology of safety audits has also been about digital capacity training and introducing these women and, and making it very clear to them that the smartphone is not something to be scared of. Um, but also part of this has been our petition drafting. We've done two sets of petition drafting with the women in Kochi and in Trivandrum, and it's been mainly around drainage because it was around the flooding, uh, Kerala floods. Uh, and this is a picture that uh, we've just been sent recently by Saki, our local NGO, where the women, uh, we, we helped the women draft this petition around drainage. And they took this petition, they handed it to the mayor, um, and he accepted it. And he said he was going to do something about it. We're still waiting. But at least they found the confidence, and they know what the process is to draft a petition and, and approach the authorities. 
And then finally, we have, I want to show you a rough cut. It's not final yet. We are creating an animation, and we have an opportunity for an exhibition in Delhi uh, Code Studios in July. Uh, once our animation and the rest of our story maps and toolkits are finished, we are, we are going to be taking this to India and showing it there. Uh, and the animation, which I'll show you to in a minute, is an online campaign for a right to urban technology. And we've, we've had an animator in India who's uh, done this work for us in close conversation with us. Um, so I'm just going to show it to you. And, and of course, it's open to feedback and um, suggestions. Right, so let me end with the animation, and then I will hand it to um, Kathy. So. The world is getting more digital by the day. Cities are developing new technologies at a rapid pace in order to become smart. This means the city's functioning will be heading towards more online services and facilities. But there still exists a deep digital divide. Those without access to digital technology face exclusion from what the city can offer, denying them the right to their city. This discrimination is faced most strongly by the marginalized sections of society and among those most affected are women. The UN Sustainable Development Goals aim to address global issues for a sustainable future for everyone. Let's look at SDG number 5, Gender Equality, according to which the proportion of women owning a smartphone is an indicator of women empowerment. Our research suggests that it is not merely the ownership of smartphones that can help in the empowerment of women. Let's try to understand this a little more clearly, taking the example of smartphones. This is Hindu. She lives in a smart city which has developed mobile applications that make it easier for a woman to navigate safely through the city. Let's say that Indu does not have a smartphone. She only owns a basic mobile phone. This could be because A. Her family thought that she would misuse the phone and forbid her from owning one. B. She is not familiar with smartphones and is intimidated by them. C. Her family uses her smartphone, so she settles for a basic phone. Or D. She cannot afford it. Now, it's late evening and her task is to find the safest and quickest route to travel from point A to point B by avoiding all the danger spots. Without a phone to assist her, she may not have access to information about which parts of the city are safe. Here, let's say Indu owns a smartphone. But owning a phone does not mean she has the knowledge of what all the device can do. What use is the phone to her if she does not know how to use it in times of need? She is back in the same tough position as before. Here, Indu has a smartphone and she knows how to use a safety app and call for help. But there is still a problem. This time, it is the network. Indu does not have the range required for the app to work. Through no fault of hers, she is left helpless and is still as unsafe as ever. By now, it is quite clear that just by owning a smartphone, one can not assume digital empowerment. There is a lot more to it than that. It requires the right to urban technology. This is about accessing technology and being able to use it meaningfully. It includes the right to accessible and free internet, the right to legible and gender-friendly apps, and the right to contribute information about the city. Ensuring this right enables a pathway to empowerment, bringing us back to the crux of this exercise. Enabling this right to urban technology is crucial for exercising a gendered right to the city and should go into the policy making of every smart city. Good. Thank you.